This is a series of portraits. But the portraits are not of real women. They're of ideas. The happy mother. The exiled daughter. The prostitute. The suicide. They employ an array of signs and a roster of beautiful models to explore the vicissitudes of moral corruption, the apparently inevitable downfall wrought by the wrong expression and use of female sexuality. But alongside this gallery of chimeric, essentialized womankind is another group of women. Women represented only by their name, often not even written by their own hand. There is no surviving portrait of these women. Maids of all work, dressmakers, milliners. Indeed, there would ordinarily be little to show their existence, little trace of them in the archives. But for one fact, one flesh and blood fact. Received. A blank child. The blank day of blank. Received a blank child. Within a few weeks, this official form, printed on a piece of parchment, happened to come in our way. Finding it to be associated with the histories of more than 20,000 blank children, we were led into an inquiry concerning those little gaps in the decorous world. Their home and headquarters whence the document issues is the Foundling Hospital, London. Dickens memorably called this kind of infant a blank child. But what of their mothers, these future absences in the children's lives? There was a Victorian label for them too. The Fallen Woman. In 2015, the Foundling Museum, which along with the Children's Charity Quorum, occupies the Foundling Hospital's original site, devoted an exhibition to this subject. The Fallen Woman was used as a term to describe a very particular kind of social, moral and sexual identity. Um, it described women who weren't prostitutes but they were also not respectable women. They had been respectable, but they had lost that moral identity through having had sex outside of marriage. And this is a picture called The Lost Path of 1863, and you can see it's really simple. But what it sums up is that whole narrative of a fall, the woman being homeless, desperate, in the snow, um, beautifully painted, these kind of details of, of the snow around the hem of her skirt and, and so on. And of course the baby, which we assume um, has no father. This is where um, the, the story of the Foundling Hospital comes into this kind of story that paintings and prints um, are also showing. These paintings render desperation aesthetic. But what of the actual women? Those who approached the Foundling Hospital did so knowing it was the best alternative to living in destitution with their child, or to the relatively common practice of infanticide. The brush with Victorian bureaucracy that their situation precipitated allows us, the curious of the 21st century, some insight into their lives. There's over 800 feet of archive material. You drill right down into it when you when you call up your one box of material. Um, and for me, this was mostly the petitions that the women who wanted their children to be accepted by the hospital needed to fill in as part of the admissions process. Many of the stories that are revealed through these petitions, I mean, they are quite shocking accounts of women who have been seduced is the word used on the petitions and by the hospital but today really we would call many of these instances cases of rape. The, the way the petitions are stored 
in in piles you know you get this overwhelming sort of sense of the the hundreds of names of these women sort of coming at you in waves really which is compounded by the um the the register books which list the names of the women and you know there's these thick sort of vellum bound books with pages after pages of the the successful women's names because of course we have to remember that a good number even the majority of these women's babies were not accepted One, that the petitioner is poor and has no relations able or willing to maintain her child. Two, that her delivery and shame are known to few persons, being either her relations or inmates of the house in which the circumstances occurred. Three, that in the event of the child being received, the petitioner has a prospect of preserving her station in society and obtaining by her own exertions an honest livelihood. So the very first thing that you had to do, or have someone do on your behalf, was go and pick up a form, a petition form, from the gatekeeper at the, the porter's lodge of the hospital. And already then you're being judged, because the porter, the gatekeeper, has a logbook in which he makes his notes on callers. And if you look at this book, you can see it in the archive. He's not just writing down the names of people. He's saying respectable woman, well-dressed gentleman, and so on and so forth. So there's already at that early stage, you're just going to pick up the form. You know, there's, there's some element of judgment going on. The founding hospital committee was only interested in mothers who had been respectable and who would benefit from its charity to return to respectability. It would only accept first-born children. A woman could fall once, but not twice. Only unmarried mothers, no longer in a relationship with a father, were eligible. The wording of the petition encouraged applicants to frame their predicament in terms of seduction and desertion. If the petition was acceptable to the committee, the woman would be invited to attend an interview at the hospital. I've thought a lot about what the experience of the interview would have been, specifically for the women. It's clear that the um, essential dynamic was one of power and authority um, in terms of the, uh, the governors who were interviewing the women, and of vulnerability, um, embarrassment, um, shame, all kinds of um, emotions um, that these women might have experienced while they were being asked the questions that we are aware of from the archive material. Is this your first child? When did you first see the father of the child? In what manner did your acquaintance with him commence? Where did you reside when you were seduced? And what led to your seduction? Was the criminal intercourse repeated? When did you first find yourself pregnant? Did you inform the father of your pregnancy? Should you be relieved of your child? What do you intend to do to gain a livelihood? 
I was introduced to the father by a friend. I became acquainted with the father at a singing class. He was lodged in my sister's house. In April, he took me to a house, stating that he would introduce me to a friend who had a piano. He used to speak of marriage. (sighs) I found, however, that there was no piano but a bed. When I was about to leave the room, he caught hold of me forced me upon the sofa. I wished to leave, but he prevented me and kept me for some time. I struggled with him until I lost all power. And then he affected his purpose. Intercourse took place against my consent. My sister soon returned, but I did not then tell her what had happened. I was miserable. I felt ashamed to tell her. It was never repeated, and this I would swear. If relieved of my child, my sister will help until I can get employment. If relieved of the child, I propose going on with my work. If relieved, my father will take me back. So after women had been interviewed by the board of the hospital, the next thing that would happen is that the hospital would investigate their story. And one of the ways they would do this was by asking for letters of reference from family members, friends, and most often uh, former employers. And quite often we see those letters coming to the hospital uh, on morning paper. So the paper is edged in black and the envelope itself might be sealed with a black seal and the sense is that you know there's a huge amount of 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 pity for these women because of what has happened to them um but there's also the sense that to fall in this way is a kind of death it's death of the character death of any future hopes in many ways the material trappings of this philanthropic bureaucracy resemble an economy of paper in which small squares of parchment represent whole lives. A note of admission was given to the women who had passed the rigorous admissions procedure. It was their child's ticket to a new life. And for the mother, it represented a transaction by which they could return to a recognised place in society. On the day appointed, usually a Tuesday, the mother, with her child, presents herself at the institution and is ushered into the room shown in our sketch, where a fire blazes on the hearth, and before which a basket of infant's clothes is placed. The mothers, for three children are usually received at a time, assisted by a female attendant, undress their babes and wrap each one in a large grey woolen shawl. The doctor present examines them thoroughly, after which they are clothed in the garments provided, but instead of a dress, a white nightgown is substituted, the shawl is once more placed around each child, and its name written on a slip of paper and pinned to it. The attendant now leaves the room. The doctor presses a bell. Three foundling girls enter, and almost before the mothers are aware, their babies are carried away never to be known to them again, unless in time to come they can prove that they are in a position to benefit their children by taking them from the institution. The mother is given the clothes the child was brought in, together with a ticket bearing a number, the date, and the figure of a sheep holding a small branch in its mouth. Today, it is hard to remember that this scene marks a success for these mothers. By exchanging her child for a receipt, she was able to resume her working life, to reascend to respectability in the knowledge that her child was being looked after. She achieved this success by exhibiting before the hospital committee the shame and secrecy corresponding to their expectation of a fallen woman. <laughs>